want to know how to get ready read this book period and don't worry we're really? recording this we're recording this we're recording go it. get yeah. the book before you go see the show in fact take your little mm-hmm. notes with you <laughs> please Welcome to Cosmic Couch. I am Captain Samantha G of the Black and Space Star Crew, and I'll be guiding you through this journey. Today, I am joined by my fellow space traveler, Michelle A. Prince. We are gearing up for Willie Mammoth and Strathmore's production of Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, as written by Toshi Reagan and Bernice Johnson Reagan from Sweet Honey in the Rock. So we're here to talk about Black creativity and all things Afrofuturistic and more. So uh, Michelle A., tell us who you are. Hello, my name is Michelle Mickey, Michelle Prince, Mickey Teleports. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and I am, I'm a person, I'm a Black person surviving, making it in these here United States. Um, I am very much interested in expressive and expansive gender that really animates me. I'm always uh, wondering and interested in discussions of gender. I'm here for collective determination and healing, um, and I'm very inspired by by pleasure field expressions for Black queer transformation and liberation. Um, I'm also the resident scholar um, and director of movement for Black in Space Collective and um, a doctoral candidate in the Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a Black queer person. I'm a, a non-binary Black queer person trying to make it. Um, a parent trying to raise a, a Black boy in this world. And um, that that's what I really am. Rooted in my things. family. Rooted in my family. That is a lot of things. I love the plurality of you. I love the expansiveness of you. Thank you for sharing those things with us. And when you're not on the mothership, where can we find you? You can find me, um, well, in the virtual. I I, I find myself sometimes at Mickey Teleports um, and at Switch Prints. We can send that out. And um, I try to stay off the digital sometimes because (laughs) of, of the health. But I'm moving back into that space. So you can find me there. Absolutely, absolutely. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with me, once again, I'm Captain Samantha G. I am the director of Sway for the Black and Space Star crew. I am a multi non-disciplined artist and entertainer. Uh, I am very much a provider of laughter, a provider of joy. Um, and I offer myself as a, as a gift. <laughs> I don't think I'm God's gift, but I offer myself as a gift. Uh, And uh, when I am not on the mothership, I am streaming myself playing video games terribly. I have no idea how to play them uh, or doing ASMR or live painting or just walking around outside on Twitch. Mm. And you can find me on all platforms at Shebe Samantha G. So uh, if you don't know, uh, Mickey, Black in Space has been collaborating with the folks at Woolly Mammoth. Uh, We were selected as one of their connectivity core partners in 2021, and we've been working with them since 2020. We're so grateful for that partnership. Please read our takeover of their newsletter. It includes a spacescape by the one and only uh, Baron Hawk Portier and our letter by Patience the Pilot, who is uh, one of our beloved members of the Black and Space Star crew. And that letter is about why Black joy is revolutionary. You can also catch me in the juke joint doing a little poetry, okay? So uh, now that people know who we are, let's just dive into the conversation really because we don't have much time, but I really, really want to get to the meat of this because you have a wealth of knowledge um, on not just Octavia Butler, but Afrofuturism and Afrofuturist texts. And we really want to get the benefit of your knowledge while you're here with us. We do not take it lightly. So I'll just flat out ask, who is Octavia Butler? Or like we like to say in Black and Space, Mother Octavia. I'm a student. I'm a student. But first and foremost, I'm, I'm a lifelong student. So I, I never take on that expertise title ever, no matter my studies, uh, because I'm a student. And what I know is that Octavia E. Butler is one of those 
um, four persons that changed my life forever. And so I'm so honored to, to know her work. Um, Octavia E. Butler, Octavia Estelle Butler was, uh, she has transitioned. She was a writer. She was a writer of what we now call Afrofuturism. I don't know that she would call it that, but what we now call Afrofuturism, she wrote about Black future. She wrote about the Black Tastic. She wrote about Black women, Black leads, Black femmes, Black girls um, coming of age mm. into a world that wasn't necessarily created for them, but taking leadership and taking the reins for that world and bringing themselves their families and forming communities to take those people um, on, you know, very, very much Harriet Tubman um, in literary, in the, in the literary imagination. Um, Octavia E. Butler was born in the 1940s and she was raised in Pasadena, California by her mother and her grandmother. And she saw science fiction and fantasy on TV and she thought, wait a minute, I could do better. <laughs> because I'm not seeing myself. And also this, the you know, the way that she tells her story is, you know, she was seeing things that were silly. They didn't make, it didn't make sense to her understanding of the world as, as a 12 year old, you know, as a child. And so she, she took it upon herself to say, I can do better and I can share this with the world, which is what we're so grateful for. Um, and that's a little bit of what I know about Octavia E. Butler. I know she loved her books and yes. that she moved from Pasadena to Seattle with like over 500 books or something like that. Wow. There was an article about it. Um, so, and as a, a book collector myself, <laughs> she, she's a light to me in so many ways. And she's a light to so many other um, Black women, Black queer people, um, Black writers, writers, you know, to so many people. Mm. Now, we won't shame any of you book collectors. It is okay to buy another book, even if you have not finished the books that you bought last week. Even if you have a row of books. I'm not a doctor, but I highly recommend buying a new book before you finish the last one, or even start the last one you bought. I'm sure Octavia Butler would support us, especially if you are buying her works. So if you have not re read any of the Parable series, do yourself a favor and get your hands on Parable of the Sower, Parable of the Talents, get your hands on Octavia Butler's work. Uh, but let's go back to what you mentioned about who Octavia Butler was and how that work kind of transcended time, how she was ahead of her time, even as a child, and you know how that translates into even some of the music that you've done. So let's talk about the Midnight Space Scape that you have coming. Yeah, I um, was invited I'm so honored to have been invited to create and experiment with sound. Sound is um, a site that I really love to work mm -hmm. in. I work in sound and I work in dance and I work in text as a scholar and as a storyteller. But sound is something that really animates me as a dancer. And Afrofuturism, thinking of Black people being in other worlds and being leaders and being at the forefront in these other spaces really animates me. And so I was able to put together a collection of sound that is meant to help us think about the history of Afrofuturism, to help us think about what it might animate for you as a, mm -hmm. as a you know, sitting in a dark space, sitting in a room, having this soundscape that is directly referencing and using language and words of Octavia E. Butler that is using the realities of Mae Jameson who, that is talking about Sun Ra and his experiences of uh, prophetic transformation to get us to think about or just to be in the world just to submerge yourself in the world sonically um, maybe even turn off the thinking sometimes because it to feel to feel, to feel. The world. To feel yeah. to to stop thinking about the world and start sensing it and you know when we stop thinking and we start sensing immediately we're drawn to our own bodies mm -hmm. and we start sensing here and then we can sense outward and really you can't really sense further than your fingertips will stretch and mm -hmm. um my worry far exceeds my wingspan and so if I can bring it back to my body and then just take it out to my fingertips anything that helps me do that mm -hmm. is, is helpful as someone who 
uh, does work through anxiety. Um, and so I'm thankful for the soundscapes that folks like you and Bernhard Portier have provided because they do put you in this, uh, I'm in a dark space, but now my dark space is being animated with other things. And um, I think that is really something that Black in Space has aimed to do, where when you think about space and you think about the cosmos, you do think about this very, very dark space, very vast space, and also like a very terrifying space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> space itself is horrifying. Um, the idea of like fire and land, masses just like floating around on their own um, and in close proximity to one another sometimes or in super duper far proximity from one another, that concept is horrifying and gorgeous and exciting and makes you feel very small and makes you feel very unimportant in a way that's comforting. So Mickey, thank you for all that you've shared. I really wanna move into some structured questions just in the interest of time, some questions that I think would really benefit us in this conversation, but to anyone watching, I really think it'll connect you to Octavia Butler's work, but then also connect you to the concept of uh, Afrofuturism or whatever you wanna call it, thinking about us in terms of not just now, not just then and not just after. Uh, so what is Afrofuturism and how does it show up in Octavia Butler's work? I love that you say Afrofuturism or whatever you wanna call it, because I think it must be said that the term itself, how it's genesis is something that always makes me, or it just makes me want to tell the story of its genesis, mm -hmm. right? So the term Afrofuturism was coined, I want to say 1994 by Mark Derry, who's a, a, white, a white man um, who has a, an interest and in, a scholarly interest in this work and has, a, you know, wants to get us to think about this. But what he was writing about, and to me what is, is very interesting and important, what he was writing about was something that he was observing, that he was mm -hmm. observing Black students, Black community members, Black scholars around him displaying this sort of vested interest in stories and narratives, um, in music, in fashion, in aesthetics that were conjuring this sort of notion of Black people living elsewhere otherwise. And because of his observations, because of seeing Black people already engaging in this uh, uh, project of being, of self-expression, of re rewriting the self, he labeled it Afrofuturism, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that telling that story is very important because Sometimes I'm like, I, I'm an Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism is important because it's a language that we, we know and we have a community around it. But it's a, a universe, you know? Afrofuturism is a multiverse of experiences, narratives, media creations. It's you're teleporting around this world, these worlds to get glimpses of what it might be like for Black people to see themselves in the future. What would they be doing in this future? Um, and, and what kind of politics might they be navigating? What sort of um, creations might they be envisioning? What, what sorts of geniuses are they allowing themselves to be used for? And that shows up all over Octavia E. Butler's work. Um, so we can call it Afrofuturism. I don't know that it's something that she would have called it herself, but it is something that you know, I'm I'm using I'm I'm taking license to to call at this moment because in her work we see black girls, black women, black femmes, we see queer people, we see people of color forming communities, um, forming legacies to to traverse their their present circumstances, mm -hmm. but in order to create a, a long lasting future that may or that may not even include right this earth because Octavia Butler is introducing us to this idea that our place is amongst the stars you know mm -hmm. as Lucille Clifton told us about being star shining clay that Octavia E. Butler is getting us to say that you know think of you are made of this stuff so of course your your place might also be amongst that which created you um, and your God might be change, you know, your God might be of a new name still and powerful, but needs you to work it, you know, your God might need you. 
um, in a way that a previous God might not. Ooh, listen, you you know, outside of this she conversation, <laughs> she gave she us a lot, a lot and so continues it, to give us so much. Like, why would you give us the gift and then keep giving it to us even as an ancestor? And we thank you. Uh, and there's so much we can, just from that question alone, there's so many conversations that we could have, but I really, really want to talk more about Parable of the Sower. Um, you know, not just the genius of Octavia Butler, but we're gonna witness the genius of uh, Toshi Reagan uh, and uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan. But Parable, the Sower, Parable of the Sower, the book, um, when was it written? What was going on at the time? Let's talk a little bit about that work. Yeah, so it was originally published, in, according to my copy, my very used copy. Uh, it says 1993. Um, and what was happening? <laughs> You know, it's funny because what was happening politically for me, let me tell you what was happen poli happening politically for me in 1993. Please, I yeah. was very divided in the cafe in the cafeteria around whether or not the the pepperoni and cheese pizza they used to give us was better than that uh, that Mexican pizza that they used to give us on Fridays. That was, was what was going on politically for me in 1993 because I was what, five? Um I, I don't do math well. Maybe I wasn't. Oh no, I was. I was five. Um, however, in in that time frame, okay, we're looking at the '90s, so I guess that's what the Clinton era and things like that. We know what the hell was going on politically. The same stuff that's going on politically now. If we're talking about folks that are disenfranchised or folks that are from quote unquote, I'm not even. I, we not marginalized. We just we just we we generalized. We from generalized communities. Uh, you know, living at the margins of the imperial core. Uh, but yeah, you know, it was the nineties and, you know, a lot was going on politically for black people and for queer people and for black women and for women, you know, if we really want to talk about it, but, you know, a lot of the things that were going on politically then are going on politically now. Um, I can imagine what it would be like to be a black woman so far ahead of their time in the 90s where the books that you wrote or the work that you did, the art that you were making didn't even have its own uh, genre or name until well after your transition. And a lot of times we see that the art precedes the genre or the, the talent precedes whatever comes after it. So um, we know what was going on politically in 1993. Mess. Some of us were there. Some of us were there as children, but some of y'all were there. Some of y'all watching were there. Yes, <laughs> mess. But the book starts in 2024, which is two years from now, which now, if you've read the book, I know you're sitting there going, Whoo. for those of you who haven't read the book, you're probably going, wow, a, a, a futuristic tale that was set in 2024, which means we are now living in the time period in which Octavia was writing about. So with 2024 being two years from right now, like how real does that feel? Shout out to Sylvester, you make me feel mighty real. But how real does that feel? In Parable of the Sower, we have a, a presidential candidate that wins on a campaign that's basically make America great again. In Parable of the Sower, we have the dismantling of Black and Brown communities. We have um, makeshift communities that are forming. We have gated communities. Now, I grew up in South Central LA and gated communities was always a thing that people would talk about because, you know, in the hills, there's these gated communities where you're just so safe, right? Mm -hmm. This illusion of safety for some, for, for the wealthy, for the privileged, um, the complete breaking down of systems of governments, the complete breaking down of social services, rampant, rampant environmental degradation, mm. um, epidemics of addiction with new designer drugs that are created to enhance, you know, human functioning and human, uh, what's that word that they like to throw around? Productivity. Productivity. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There, you know, and Lauren Olamina's 
Lauren Oya Olamina, right, who goes through these transformative changes as her namesake would have her do. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, is the product of this, is a child, you know, in, in the 80s before, as a person growing up in South Central LA, you know, there's this term, the crack baby. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, so, were, we were the crack baby generation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The very first person that I ever lost. Mm. Yeah. May Isaac rest in peace forever, forever. Forever. It was a child. Mm. It was a beautiful, beautiful child. Beautiful child that we lost because of the, the just the um, circumstances of his birth. Mm. Because of the community, because of a sick community around him because of a community sick, because of a targeting, because of a pushing, right? We, we see all of this actually in the text. Yeah. Um, that this, these drugs end up wiping out whole communities. And, and very specific communities. Very specific communities. Indigenous, black, brown, immigrants, you know, these communities. So, I feel like I'm I'm missing so many, but but there's love, you know, there's there's love, and that's happening in this political economy too, right? That the love of the people that are being targeted is still so strong and still so resilient that it is capable of transforming and becoming something new, becoming a seed, an earth seed mm -hmm. to be planted. The creation of culture. There's still the creation of culture, there's still the cultivation of family somehow <laughs> in those. Uh, in those in those circumstances, there's still the creation and the cultivation of family. You mentioned how you are a parent and the idea that you can look around and see the world as it is and still want to love someone and still want to bring someone else into it and usher them through it as best you can. There is still love. There is still family. There is still culture. There is still community somehow. That's wild to me. Wild. <laughs> It'll never not be wild to me. Oh, how real does that feel? It, mm -hmm. it feels like a documentary. It, it feels like a foretelling or a foreshadowing. Honestly, I feel like for people who have not read Parable of the Sower, if you gave them the book and told them that the book was written um, this year, they would believe you, number one. Um, it would still be relevant and like good and engaging and entertaining, but then they would say, oh, well, you know, she was kind of just looking around and writing about what was going on. And I'm like, wow, how ahead of your time do you have to be where the things that you wrote about are happening to the letter? Mother Octavia was a prophetess, okay? <laughs> that That's divinity, if, if nothing else. Um, but I digress. <laughs> What references do we see from parable in popular culture today? Mm. References in popular culture. I don't know why the girl with the gifts, with all the gifts, mm. keeps popping up to me for some reason. Um, but I do see in this story of this, this girl, because I think this being a, a coming of age narrative mm. of the story of a a girl who uses the trappings of boyhood and masculinity in order to be able to safely make it mm -hmm. <laughs> to womanhood. Um, and, and I know that sh she makes it to womanhood because I, I read Parable of the Talents, right? Mm -hmm. But Spoiler. Spoiler, right? But she's 15, 16, 17, 18 over the course of this story. And um, I see that in the girl with the gifts, mm -hmm. just being able to navigate a fraught childhood um, and, and be the one that people need. Mm. Like you're trying, you're trying to survive while at the same time maintaining a gift that you are to share with everyone else. I, I see that in that. Um, I see her in popular culture in, in people's aesthetics and the ways that they they just think about moving um, to create. I, I see it in Black Panther. I see Octavia Butler's um, influence in, I see her in Black Horror. I see her influence in things like Get Out, honestly. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. just like being able to to think that what if question like Octavia Butler made the what if question so relevant for black people to use as a tool to imagine otherwise um and other other people have done that as well but we're here to talk about Octavia Butler um and so I just think that I, I see her in so many places it's hard to parse out but anytime you you see Black, a Black person visualizing themselves into the future and, and standing on that proudly, I see the influence of, of Octavia Butler. Absolutely. Like in all these dystopian uh, TV shows and, and, and movies, because that's now the thing, since we all are just like laughing to keep from crying. It's like, okay, well, let's just write about this dystopian life that we're living. <laughs> let's continue to act it out on stages. Uh, but then also like when you were talking about the girl with the many gifts, I don't know why Marseille or Mar Marseille Martin kind of mm -hmm. pops up to me almost in like her character that she plays on Black is just Diane. There's something about that energy to me that where she's just this very small little black girl navigating very big concepts and kind of like driving the family forward and tackling big issues by herself and I, I always think of her as just such a little force that's like beyond her years that kind of thing um, and then also like thinking about Afropunk and how you mentioned like people's like aesthetics and how that Afrofuturistic aesthetic is kind of catching it's been catching for some years but now it's just more of a mainstream thing where we are conceptualizing our blackness and how that blackness is presented to the world, how we even present that blackness to ourselves and, you know, all of the limits that were put on our blackness and not by black people. I'll be clear. The limitations on black expression were not put on black, black people by black people, no matter how black people have perpetuated that through internalizing it, that was never put on black people by black people. That's an aside, but um, removing those limitations on purpose um, or even on accident. I look at the, um, what are they? Are they calling them Generation Y? What do they call these TikTok babies? I love them. But I look at how the Afrofuturistic aesthetic is kind of just their baseline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the Willow Smiths and that's just their, that's their, that's their baseline for us. Some, some of us had to find that. Um, some of us had to see it on MySpace or see it on Tumblr. And for them, that is just their baseline. And I am so proud to be part of the generation that displayed that so loudly for them, you know, that yeah. went to the, their little first Afropunk in the park and things like that mm -hmm. before Afropunk was a big, you know, movement or, you know, was willing to listen to alternative music or anything like that. Um, just to give a paradigm of how you can live outside of your circumstances. Um, so we've talked about how we see uh, parable in pop culture, and, you know, we've talked about some of the themes of parable, but like, what's your favorite theme? What, what is your favorite quote? What's something that you're just like, ooh, whenever you think about parable of the sower? Well, okay, something that I think of, ooh, every time I think of parable of the sower is just the, the poetry. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who haven't read parable of the sower, each chapter starts with these um, poetic lines that are from Earthseed, the books of the living, mm -hmm. which is what the character Lauren Oya Olamina is actually writing over the mm -hmm. course of her, her journey. She's making this journey and she's not just experiencing this journey, she's actually able to find the, the meditative space and the grace and the, and the space time, which I also find absolutely remarkable yes. to write about her journey. To, to collect her experiences, to try and codify them because she's always mindful of this future that mm. she knows that's just going to happen. And so she works in accordance with this belief. You know, she has this strong faith that guides honestly everything that she does. And it brings out the most beautiful verses about what God is, who we are, what our purpose is, what we can do or choose not to do. And I, you know, you, you just have to, you have to read these beautiful, if you read nothing else, read every single poem. That part. And, and tell me that you don't fall in love with it. Because that part. these earth sea poetry, uh, you know, people have formed spiritual practices based on the beauty and the quality and the 
the prescience, the the you know the genius of these these collection of words. Um, and so that's something that I always think of and is definitely one of my all-time favorites of this. Um, but also as a, a non-binary person, as a genderqueer, um, seeing Lauren use masculinity as a tool mm. in such a way to navigate towards safety, which I find very fascinating and very interesting. Extreme. And um, you know, the history of, of Black women in this, this country and beyond is something that always fascinates me because Black women is, is why I exist. Um, you know, even I'm non-binary, but Black womanhood is my blueprint. So when I think of uh, Lauren navigating these spaces, it, it opens up, you know, as someone who gets to teach this sometimes, a space of conversation that I don't often get to bring up when I'm talking about Blackness and youth and, and gender, right? And Lauren is just like this perfect example for me to draw on. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, there's a lot of characters that Octavia E. Butler created that for me as like a queer, Black queer person and gender queer, I hadn't seen, you know, these characters. There's this character named Jodas in her um, Lilith's Brood series where mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's a different way that one could like see a gendered being physicalized and that was so profound for me. So, and Lauren is one of those characters too. How about you? So I, I love that you mentioned masculinity as a tool because that is always something that stuck out for me in Parable of the Sower. Um, and then I also like how you mentioned how like that series made you like, oh wait, I could, I could do that. I could do that. I love work that you see yourself in, but you see yourself in ways that, oh, I haven't presented myself that way yet. Um, or I never thought that it was okay to present myself in that way, or I didn't think that, you know, I love work that does that. But when you talk about masculinity as a tool, I think about how the Black feminine or the Black woman has been masculinized um, in popular culture or in just in American culture, period, in global culture, how the dark femme, um, especially the fat dark femme, um, you know, specifically the fat Black femme, and how Black femininity has been masculinized to in negate. culture. To negate period. us. To negate us. To, to make us less worthy of care and comfort. To make us less worthy of love. To make us more worthy for pain and suffering um, and for loss and for work. Hard, back-breaking labor. And the idea of taking that concept of, oh, you know, you think I look like a boy? Okay. You know, you think you think I look like a boy, you think my my features and I'm going to use this to help navigate this hellscape that I'm living in to prove to myself further that I'm smarter than you, boo. I already read this. <laughs> I already read this. I understand the script. And this is I'm how done. I'm going to have Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I love that concept of um quite frankly, us being smarter than them. And it's not on some eugenics type stuff. It's more so like Never. you have created this framework where I have to bob and weave and hop and jump and skip. And somehow you don't believe that while you've been walking on flat pavement, that my calves have not got grown stronger. My spiritual calves, my intellectual calves are not stronger than yours. It's just, you created that framework that uh, supports my calves and they're growing. Watch me leap. <laughs> watch, watch me leap. Me leap. Watch, Watch me, me so I'm, I'm a bound so high, it's going to look like I'm flying. Period. Like we know people make great work when they're depressed and oppressed. So why oppress us so hard if you don't want us to make these lovely songs and these beautiful dances and these wonderful books? Like I, it, it anyway, moving right along. Um, because I, not only do I get excited when talking about Parable of the Sower, because it has been a part of my life for so long. Like, as you mentioned, 1993, we were babies when that book came out and to Little. catch on to it so early accidentally, you know, cause luckily for me, my mother was an avid reader. We had books in the mm -hmm. home, that kind of thing we may not have had everything, but we had books in the home. So you come across a book and you read it. I had no idea that I was being exposed to something that would be one of the frameworks for my life and my living and my art and would pop itself up unintentionally. It wasn't something that I was even thinking about in my art. 
Um, and so I am very excited to see Parable of the Sower as it has been conceptualized uh, by Toshi Reagan and by uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan, especially through music, something I am so connected to. I'm thrilled mm -hmm. about that. Um, and so tell us about that unique soundscape. Tell us about that opera. <sighs> I have uh, been fortunate enough to see this work um, once in Philadelphia, like a very, very early um, version of it. And I wish I was a musicologist so that I can really <laughs> take you through yeah. everything that you're going through uh, uh, through this, but it, it's an opera. It's an opera, so you're, it's epic. And you're feeling the all of the words <laughs> from the page surround you. And in my experience, I was able to look out into the audience or into onto the stage, mind you, excuse me, and see, you know, this beautifully hued cast mm -hmm. singing in a range of tones, you know, giving me folk and giving me gospel mm -hmm. and giving me polyrhythms and mm. percussion and giving me, you know, just giving me what I need in order to feel the thump of the rhythm of a revolution in song. I mean, th that's the story that they're giving. And thankfully we have <laughs> uh, musicians and vocalists of the caliber to actually bring that to life. I, don't, I can't even speak to the to the history of Toshi Reagan and Bernice and Reagan. I mean, listen, if you don't Sweet know, Honey who, in the Rock is yes. the soundtrack of my child's life. That is something my child knows very very well. Um, it, it's the it's the honey and the butter to a great day. Their work uh, elevates me and keeps me going. Um, going back to watch old music videos of Toshi Reagan strumming that guitar and being on sidewalks and having people mm -hmm. contend and, mm -hmm. and have to confront the music and then be overtaken by the beauty and the the harsh truths but the simplicity and the tone of Toshi's voice I don't know I'm rambling but but you can you can you can ramble when it comes to the complexity of music and also the sure. the vastness of this work and I think something that you said was um, you know giving what giving you what you need to feel the thump and I think about the um, very physical experience of going to the opera or even to the ballet for some and um, so for those anyone who has been to ballet or been to an opera um, you know that there is the potential for a very physical reaction to what you're seeing and um, as someone who loves theater and loves music and loves dance um, I found that I did not have that physical experience at the ballet until I experienced a ballet with a very well-hued cast, um, until my first Ailey experience. Um, and so I am looking forward to an operatic experience that is very well-hued. Um, I have similar experiences with like Broadway experiences, but I'm so looking forward to an opera experience that is very well hued so I can lose the salt water through my eyes. You know, I want to cry and I know I'm going to cry. Um, and I also think about the musicians. How I don't you said, know how you wouldn't cry. Listen, it's going to happen. I, I don't know. It's going to happen. I'm going to cry. I think about the genius of Toshi Reagan and the genius of Bernice Johnson Reagan, but I also think about the genius of those that I know to be part of the cast. And I'm like, how you got some of my favorite voice? Like how you get all these people together? How you fit all this fire in one fireplace? Is the roof going, but is the roof, are we gonna have to say that? More fire for your fire burn. But honestly, I am so looking no, forward. Listen, <laughs> listen, go on and do it. <laughs> be, be who you are, okay? This is a safe space, but I am so looking forward to having that kind of experience. Um, the kind of experience that everybody deserves in art. Everyone deserves to see themselves in art, not because of any like birthright, but because art is so universal. Art is so global. There are so many people making so much art everywhere that if you can't see yourself in art, it is because systemically that art is not, is being kept from you. 
whether it is because the people who make the art that you would connect to don't have the finances, don't have the support, don't have the access for the art to get to you, or the people who, who are making the frameworks under which you experience art don't deem the art that would speak to you as art. That is also an aside. We won't go there. But, uh, you know, aside from uh, what you've already mentioned, what what are you looking forward to most about the production? I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to my shivers. <laughs> uh, because I, I I've experienced them in the past, and I I know that they've been showing it, and and it's changed and it's growing, and it's, uh, this is a work that I remember stomping my feet Ooh. um when when I was there. So it's invitational. So I'm really excited to be invited into the world and being enfolded. Like I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah, to be in the. I'm excited. I am excited about the concept of being alive the day that my ticket comes up to go because uh, just existing and persisting in this body that I have, this skin that I have, this queerness that I've been blessed with, just existing is uh, is going to be a joy on that day. But existing in that space with all of y'all, oh. <laughs> Oh, listen, I'm, I'm so yeah. looking forward to it. And, you know, Mickey mentioned the stomping and the, and the shivers look, they and I are both very body forward in our expression. Mickey already mentioned that they are <laughs> a dancer. I've been known to cut a rug or two. Um, but if you are not a dancer, uh, if you are not uh, a clapper or an amen or a say amen, or you are still going to find something at this production. So I am so grateful for Willie Mammoth uh, and Strathmore putting on this production or taking on this production. Uh, I'm so grateful for Toshi Reagan and Bernice Johnson Reagan and the genius of their com composition. I, I I literally cannot wait. I can't wait. And your, heart, that. your heart will be filled. Like, My heart is already like 95% filled. filled. I, I really, I'm not one of those people that want to guarantee something. So I, I'll just lovingly promise. Thank, I'm telling you. Thank you. <laughs> your heart will be filled. Listen, I have no doubt about it. I, I have faith uh, in the genius of, of Black people. That, that in itself alone is the promise that continues to deliver strong. every day. Um, you know, thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you for you. Thank you for your vastness. Thank you for sharing your plurality. Thank you for sharing your other otherworldliness with us. What projects do you have coming up? You know, Octavia, Mother Octavia, my respect, has given us her gifts and continues to give her gifts every day. Willie Mammoth and Strathmore are giving us the gift of theater. Toshi Reagan and Bernice Johnson Reagan have given us the genius of, of themselves, but what are you working on? What's up next for you? Uh, right now I'm working on scholar storytelling projects. So I'm working on getting dance out there that speaks to our experience and I'm working on getting scholarship out there that speaks to our experience um, and, and storytelling. That's, mm. that's what I'm doing. And again, you can find me at Mickey Teleports and you can find me at Switch Prints. We love to see it. I can't wait to uh, hear some of these stories. It's been it's been a little while since we've been on a dance floor together. I can't wait to get on a dance floor with you. I really cannot. Um, I will be performing at Parable of the Body Rollers with uh, some of our Black in Space star crew friends. So keep that in mind. Uh, our friends at Wooly, their fellow Connectivity uh, core partners, spit that. We go way, way, way back. I go way back with Dwayne B and uh, Droopy. In fact, spit that was actually the first open mic I ever attended. Um, I was like 16, <laughs> 17 years old, holding my first little poem, shaky. And somebody was sitting on the floor talking through my piece, but I made it, I made it through, I made it through. And it's like, they've been family ever since. So I am really looking forward uh, to that collaboration. It has been many a year since I've done anything uh, with Droopy and Dwayne. In fact, Dwayne and I actually used to host an open mic on Wednesdays together. <laughs> um, so this will be full circle for us. And I know you mentioned your socials. I know you mentioned uh, everything, but just so we can have it in full, how can we reach you? Yeah, absolutely. You can find me mostly on Instagram at Mickey Teleports and at Switch Prince, S W X T C H P R X N C E. Mm, and yeah, you know, we're trying to do otherwise, do it, do it differently. Yeah. And if you're looking for me, 
on Instagram, Twitter, or Twitch. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing, I am she be Samantha G. That is S H E B E S A M A N T H A G on all platforms. Uh, and I'm so thrilled. Uh, to have carried you through this journey and looking forward to the journeys that are to come. Mickey, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for thinking it not robbery to take time from your work, but also your family to spend it with your other family. Uh, we could not uh, love you more. Uh, shout out to our founder, Lee. Lee, you are a visionary. Uh, shout out to everyone at Woolly Mammoth. We are so grateful uh, for the partnership. We are so grateful, grateful to be part of the Woolly family. And we are looking forward to seeing each of you at Parable of the Sower. I really hope you have your tickets because that thing gonna sell out, boo. It's gonna sell out. <laughs> That's here. It's gonna sell out. That's Let part of the reason why I ain't seen it yet, to be honest. Of the future sleeping on them tickets so i'm looking forward i'm really they looking will. forward to it listen okay i blinked yeah, I and the tickets will go. <laughs> okay well i hope that all of you find direct pathways to your rest mm. to, re to your recreation uh to your restoration of any sorts i hope that you find direct pathways to the people that you love i hope that you are safe and that you are cared for wherever you are. I hope that you have access to the things that make you feel like a person. I hope you feel like a person. And uh, we love being black. We love being queer. Most importantly, we love each and every last one of you. We certainly hope you love you too. Stay black y'all. And if you're not, you know, that's all right, stay that. <laughs> Ashe. Ashe.